All right, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, Amanda always does a great job. I've worked with her throughout uh, this last session. For those of you that don't know, I'm a freshman. This is my first year serving in the legislature. Actually, we're just about to start our second year. Our sessions are two years long, and we go through two different cycles with that. So uh, we are continuing this last sec session, which I think is the 54th legislature. So we'll be in the second session of the 54th legislature. And um, there are some bills that we brought up last year that are still active. So I'm gonna talk about those a little bit. I'm gonna talk about some bills that we're gonna be submitting this year, some things we're gonna do. But before I do that, I wanna kinda lay a little bit of a base because uh, we've talked about healthcare. Amanda has shown that this goes back you know, to 1992. They've been working towards this. But you know who the first president was to propose national health care? FDR. 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 Goes back further than that. Wilson. Teddy Roosevelt. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. The president that gave us the Federal Reserve, the income tax, uh, also wanted to give us nationalized health care. How nice of him. He wanted, he wanted to give that to guy. us. Not realizing that for everything that the government gives to us, they have to take something from us or somebody else to provide that. So it's not really a gift. Just like with the Federal Reserve, the income tax, all these things that they've done, these, they've done the progressive, that, that was the, the, essentially the beginning of the progressive movement. So this goes back 100 plus years ago. This isn't just something new. Now, we're fortunate that it's taken them 100 years to get to this point. That means that we have stalled at some degree. Unfortunately, we are at or beyond a tipping point right now. So we're gonna have to make some serious changes quickly to be able to turn the tide back the other direction. Uh, before we actually, uh, somebody mentioned the FDR, and uh, the reason that we have the healthcare system that we have now is because of FDR. During the wartime period, they put in different salary caps and said you could not pay certain people more than this amount, which, you know, in theory, to some people that sounds great. Unfortunately, what that does is if you have somebody from Oklahoma that is an engineer that you want to move to your plant over in, in California or New York where the cost of living is higher and you have that salary cap, well, how are you going to make up for it? The government says that you can't pay them more than this certain amount. And so for them to be able to have a, a home and a mortgage and support their wife and kids and everything that they need to do, how are we, they're going to be able to do that? Well, the government's got together with some different organizations, some unions, some different things. They said, hey, here's what we'll do. You can provide uh, employer-provided health care, and we will not count that as part of the salary cap. <coughs> so we'll give you a little workaround on a way that you can give them these benefits. That way they're actually making more but you can't pay them more, you're still within the salary cap that we've instituted. So what happened, before this was instituted, 80% of individuals purchased their own health insurance. 20% had employee provided health insurance coverage. Now, we're at the exact opposite of that. 80% of people have employee provided health, health insurance and 20% provided themselves. Government has totally flipped it on its head. And what we see is government and its omniscient knowledge is trying to provide a solution to the problem that they created. Only in government do they think that they can fix the problems they created <laughs> by doing the exact same thing that they did before. More <laughs> regulation, more interference, compounding the problem. And expect to get kudos for it. Yeah. Oh, you have some poison in your system? Here, we'll double the dosage. That'll fix it. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. But government is kind of a bizarre world. So that's, that's where we've gotten to where we are now. It's been a long time in, 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 in progress. They've been working on this for years. Uh, like Amanda said, she showed that example from 1992. They've been doing this for a long time. So there's a couple different solutions of what we can do. And we need to work on it on every level. Congressman Bridenstine can't sing his praises enough. Uh, he does such a phenomenal job. He is representing uh, not just the first congressional district, but all of Oklahoma well. He's doing a very great job up there in Washington, D.C., and I really respect what he's doing. It is not an easy job. Uh, you know, he is facing all kinds of challenges, so please do keep him and his family in your prayers. He's standing strong for us and doing what he can. We do need to address some things on the federal level, but that's going to be a challenge because the federal government, the most of the people in Washington, D.C., are so far removed from the people that they really think entirely different than the rest of America. It's, it's a to totally different mentality, and it's hard to break through to that. Really, the only solution is to get new people up there. And like we've done with Congressman Bridenstine, he's doing a phenomenal job. But he's just one out of 535. We need a majority. So we have a long way to go to do that. 
but we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to contact not just him, but every congressman in Oklahoma, because they really, should, especially our U.S. senators, they represent us. But we need to contact everybody that we can, because what they do, it doesn't matter if they're a congressman from Florida or a U.S. senator from Montana or wherever they are, what they do affects us, because they're passing laws that are, affect us nationally. So we can contact them and say, hey, I don't appreciate what you're doing. Now, they're not going to be as receptive if you're not from there, if you're not one of their constituents, but we still can do that. Where we have a little bit more influence is on the state level. But that's where we kind of have some big challenges as well. I've seen it firsthand, Amanda, Rhonda, Sandy, all the people, that have, the activists that have been very engaged and involved in this, we've seen the problems that we face from the state level. I'm going to throw out a quote. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all his policies, but I agree with his, his sentiment in this. It's from Teddy Roosevelt. He said, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The second best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing is nothing. On the state level, we've tried the worst thing. Our governor accepted the $54 million. Because, hey, it's free money. I, that is the, I will tell you, that is the, the theory in government. It's free money. They truly believe it's free money. They don't, they don't realize that it either comes out of our pockets comes from China or one of the other nations that we're indebted to to the tune of $17 trillion. It's, they literally believe it's free money. So why wouldn't we take the $54 million? Let alone the fact that any money that comes from the federal government, 30% of it is wasted on, on uh, just bureaucracy, and 40% of it is borrowed. So we're already 70% in the hole any money that we borrow from the federal government for our future generations. But the problem is that most politicians think about the next election cycle, not the next generation. That's all they think about. Well, we accept this $54 million, makes us look good, we'll give the money, you know, put it into, into setting up this exchange where people will get free health care, we'll win some votes, we'll get reelected in a landslide. That's the problem. That's, that's how they think. Most of them. Now, I'm not saying all of them, but that's how the majority of them think, especially those that have been there a long time. So we did the wrong thing. We accepted the money. Finally, after a lot of pressure from a lot of different groups, I know OK Safe, Medical Project, a lot of groups put a lot of pressure on the governor, she said, OK, we're going to give the money back because she was essentially forced to have to do it. But did the wrong thing. That was correcting doing the wrong thing. It wasn't doing the right thing. The right thing would have been to not accept the money from the get-go. So now what are we doing? Now we're doing nothing. In the legislative, from the legislative perspective, from the governor's mansion, we're essentially doing nothing regarding Obamacare. Now, it's an election year, so they'll say that we're doing things, they'll say that we're making progress, they'll talk about all these different things that they're doing, but last year, uh, Representative Ritz and myself had a bill, House Bill 1021-1021, passed the House with 72 votes. It said that the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional, it is unenforceable in the state of Oklahoma, and it is null and void as far as Oklahoma is concerned. Passed the House with 72 votes, went through committee, went through the House, came over to the Senate. You know what's happened to it since then? Nothing. We've decided to do nothing, which is the worst thing that we could do. We just let it sit there, and nothing happens with it. And they say, well, yeah, but we can't really do that. I mean, if we do that, you know, what's going to happen? Well, maybe the federal government won't give us the money. Again, it goes back to the money. Or, you know, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll try and put more regulations on us. Maybe they'll do this or do that. Well, I'm of the opinion we need to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I understand that there might be repercussions. I understand that some of us, that people might get upset and might vote us out of office. I'm willing to take that risk because it's the right thing to do. But right now we're doing it. And the reason we're doing that is because we don't really have leadership. We have leaders, but we don't have leadership because somebody that's really, that's it's in that position of leadership but is really a leader, they will lead. And that's not what we're seeing happen. We're seeing, okay, well, let's take a poll. Let's see where everybody's at. Let's see you know, what we need to do to get reelected. No, that's not what this is about. This is about protecting our rights and about future generations. This is about the future of our nation. I mean, in our Constitution, it says that we are a union of republics. You know, there's been other unions of republics before. Anyone here heard of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? <laughs> we are a union of republics, but it's are, it's up for us to decide what kind of union of republics will be. There are people that want to turn us into a Soviet socialist style of a union of republics. Absolutely, unequivocally. We've seen it over and over and over again. So we have to decide. And on the state level, there's a lot of things that we can do, a lot of things that we're working on. I mean, it has a few of them up here. Terminate the Ohio Trust. 
I ran a bill last year. I, I filed 12 Senate bills. I got one bill heard in committee. So it's still right here. All my other bills they wouldn't even bring up for a committee here, let alone onto the full floor. This bill uh, was voted on in committee. Four Republicans voted yes. Two Democrats voted no. It failed because two Republicans also voted no. It's a 4-4 four, four tie. Which, which Republicans voted no? Senator Harry Coates, who is term limited out, and Senator A.J. Griffin, who is a new senator as well. Two Republicans voted no, killed the bill. Um, Amanda talked about that, terminating the Oklahoma Health Information Exchange Trust. Because that was done, it's considered final action. I cannot file the same, the same legislation in the same session. Like I said before, we have a two-year cycle. So there's other things that we're working on doing to try to get that repealed. Somebody else can bring up that legislation, but it's not going to happen from the Senate side. So that's one of the things that was, has been addressed. We are looking at abolishing the health information, um, the, the entire act. We're looking at repealing that. I know that Representative Lewis Moore is running the bill on that, and I'm looking at running the bill for that as well. I will tell you a lot of these things are still in the works. Our bill filing deadline is not until next Thursday. So I'm talking with House members, I'm talking with the AG's office, I'm talking with grassroots, I'm talking with different people, and we are finalizing our plan of action right now. Okay, so not all these things are final right now. I know a couple different representatives um, that are looking at doing a tax credit. I know Representative Lewis Moore is and Representative Eccles. They're both looking at doing some sort of tax credit for those who do get the, the, federal, pen, the federal penalty. I know I've talked with Bob and he's talked about, well, okay, we need to come up with some funding source for that credit. I said we, we push it on the legislature and say, okay, if you're not willing to stand up for us and oppose this and not let them penalize us, then we're gonna take away some of your funds. And then you're gonna have to deal with the budget issues by giving this money back to the citizens try and force their hand a little bit and say, okay, you're not willing to stand up for us in this regard and say, no, we're gonna impose the penalties, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the people use that as a tax credit, we're gonna diminish a little bit of the slice of the pie that you guys get, and then you're gonna to have to make those tough decisions. One way or another, they need to start having to make some tough decisions because it's too easy to send it to one house or the other, let it die, put it up for a vote, and say, no, I voted for that, I'm in favor of that, you know, I signed on as a co-author, but whoever else wouldn't bring it up for a hearing. There's too many political games that are played and we need to start doing some different things. Uh, the religious benefit or business exemption, uh, Representative Eccles is actually looking at doing something new, a religious corporation, where you would have First Amendment rights within the religious corporation. We've seen you know, the lawsuit from Hobby Lobby, different organizations that this violates our religious principles, but we're looking at actually creating a religious uh, corporation, a religious LLC, to where you can, you can create that corporation and then have those First Amendment protections basically guaranteed in your founding documents. Senator, that's where individuals can join that corporation, right? Correct. There's, there's corporations. There's a couple different things, yeah, where maybe a group of people could get together and create their own corporation and use that to have that religious exemption. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some ways that we're doing what we can. We're also looking at making it to where our, our clerks will not accept federal liens put on property. Now I know that the Affordable Care Act says that there, that there will be no liens placed, but we've seen the president already changed the Affordable, Air Act, Affordable yeah. Care Act eight times with executive orders. So what's to stop them from not changing it and saying, okay, the IRS can now put liens on people. So we're looking at saying, okay, our, our, our clerks will not accept those liens. We're looking at saying that, um, that state chartered banks will not allow, allow the IRS or anyone else to actually take funds out of a bank account for those liens. So we have several things that we can do on the state level. And, uh, you know, we're... We can file all these bills, but we have to get a majority of the legislature to agree to it, to vote on it. But before that, we have to get leadership to agree to actually hear it. Get it through committee. There, we have to get it through committee first and foremost. The committee chair has to agree to hear it. And I will tell you this, when you when you contact the committee chair and ask them you know, to have a beer, bill heard or not, most of the time, that legislature doesn't, legislator doesn't even hear the, the phone calls, the emails, or anything like that. It goes through their assistant. Please be very cordial to the, the assistants. I've had bills before that were not brought up to before a committee. People have called very irate, cussed out the assistant. She did nothing wrong. It's not her decision. She's just the gateway. And it's hard to get through the gateway, but I will tell you this, it's a lot easier if you're kind and cordial. There was at one point in time, one of my bills, not dealing with this, but dealing with a different subject, that they had to clear out their office voice about three times because they were getting so many calls. They actually crashed the email server. This bill had 20-something House members signed on as co-authors. The House members were emailing 
saying we get the bill heard, and their emails were bouncing back. And still, the committee chairman did not. Okay. All that, can all can that I pressure. ask a question regarding that? In, sure. in, in the House, I know that we can't, we have the discharge petition. Is there anything in the Senate that would allow for something similar to the discharge petition where we can get it discharged out of the committee and put it on the floor for a vote? I have been told that there is, but I have not found it in the Senate rules yet. Um, I have, I had, I did read the Senate rules way back when. I'm re going to reread right. them before session, but right now I'm focusing on getting my bills filed and prepared and everything. I have heard that there, that is a possibility, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, I would like to see that change. I would like to see an option for that. If nothing else, maybe say that if you know a third of the committee members want to sign on to having a bill heard, then it must be heard in the committee. You know that the committee chairman cannot hold it up because how the system works. They put someone in as committee chairman who's turned out, okay? Because we have term limits here in Oklahoma. So on the Senate side, for four years, that person can stop any bill from being heard, can you know do whatever, bury any bill that they want, and what's what's the repercussions? The people will vote them out next time. They can't run again. They're out. So they play the bad guy. Yeah. And because of that, they get to be a committee chairman. Yeah. They get you know they get some of these different benefits. And stuff. Are there any restrictions? So if somebody's a lame duck. For four years, they, they serve as an obstacle to progress. Is there any rule that says they can't go and be an employee or lobby in the industry that they regulate? Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that there is, yeah. There's a, we, can't, we cannot have a conflict of interest. We cannot work for a government agency and be in the legislature. Um, so I'm not talking as much about from the from the benefits as far as some of them, yeah, might have a job lined out, but there's a restriction that we cannot go into any job that was created during our time. We have to wait at least two years before leaving the legislature for going into that position if there's a new position created. So there's that little bit of a barrier. I mean, they can leave and they can go and become lobbyists almost essentially right away, but they cannot go into a government-created job. So yeah, there are there are there could be other benefits to it, and I don't I haven't personally witnessed any of that happening, but I'm, I'm sure it does. I'm a little bit different kind of legislator. I don't play the political rules like like I'm expected to. I guess I work with House members, even though as a senator I'm supposed to be better than them and not talk to them. Um, I work with the Democrats, even though, you know, again, we have a super majority, we're not supposed to talk to them. Uh, all those things that we're not supposed to do that are just kind of, to me, petty political things. I try to do the right thing with this stuff. And so there are a lot of political games. I don't really know how a lot of that, I don't know how the backroom stuff operates because I'm not invited to that stuff. Uh, but I've seen enough to where I know I know how, how the thing, at least on the surface, happens. And it goes, they sign it to a committee where it can be buried, and then there's just one person who's responsible. Then everyone in leadership, every, everyone else, but that one person can say, no, I'm in favor of your bill, but he won't let it be heard. They can put it on their mailers, on their re-election campaign stuff, they can do all that stuff. So we really have to, if you, I will tell you this, if you really want them, you really want to put some pressure on them, say, okay, well, if you're for it, then sign on as a co-author. Right because then they have to put their name on it. Right? Mm -hmm. And if we have a bill with 30 co-authors, well, why is the committee chairman holding up a bill that's going to pass on the floor? Why, why is he doing that? Or even 10, or however many co-authors we can get. So that, that will put some pressure on it. So there are some things like that that we are doing. I'd be more happy to answer questions afterwards, but I don't want to take too much time because I know Bob's going to come up next and kind of kind of give us a, an overview of everything that's going on, and then I, I'll, I'll stick around and also answer questions afterwards. But thank you all for being here. We're, we are working on some things, and we are making progress, but you really need to contact your representative.